thank you for, your, for coming. I hope you enjoy yourselves. And we start by talking to the great man about various things. And to start with, it occurs to me that you are blessed as a man because you ended up doing precisely what you thought you would like to do all those years ago in Marino and Fairview at the age of, what, 10, 12, whatever? You're, you're absolutely right, Kay. I, all my life, I wanted to be a journalist. Uh, and not just a journalist on a newspaper, but a journalist on the Irish Times. And I wanted to work at the Irish Times in Dublin, and then, if possible, go to London. And God was good to me. He allowed all of those things to happen. I joined the Irish Times in the days of the the great Bertie Smiley, R.M. Smiley. Uh, and uh, he was a great friend of my father's. And the assistant editor was Alec Newman, who was my godfather. So if you ask the question, how did I get into the Irish Times, you don't have to look very far. <laughs> nothing to do with influence or anything. Nothing to do with nothing influence. To, nothing to do with influence. Talent. But go back a bit further now. You started writing uh, when you were with the RAF. Yes. Tell them about joining the RAF. You lied. Well, you? well, you and uh, most of you would be too young to remember, but in 1944, 1945, at the height of the Second World War, uh, it seemed to youngsters like me, 16 and 15 year olds, that the, the most wonderful thing uh, was to be fighting a war in the air. So myself and Fred O'Donovan, uh, who was a year younger than I was. He was 15, I was 16. We couldn't get our birth certificates to forge them to make the right age. But what we did was we went down to Fairview Church and got our baptismal certificates. <laughs> and they were much more easy to forge, to write in there. Uh, so so uh, I became Cal uh, uh, Michal O'Shannon, aged 22, when I was, when I was 16. And I can remember, I remember uh, on parade uh, as a young airman, uh, a flight sergeant coming up and inspecting us one day, and he said, O'Shannon, oh, you haven't shaved today. And I said, Chiefy, I don't shave. <laughs> <laughs> so we were as young as that. It was ridiculous to think of it now. And you made it, and you got there, and you I joined made up. It. Uh, uh, as I say, we all were determined to fly in the air, yeah. but uh, the war was ending. Uh, so <laughs> when, when I got my son joined up, it ended rather within the next fortnight, the war ended. <laughs> uh, so they, they knew we were coming. Uh, and in all the time we were there, uh, we certainly never flew aeroplanes, Gary. Okay? Oh. We used to lie a lot about it when we came out and said that we'd flown Spitfires. Did so. you ever actually hear a gun being shot in anger at any stage? Oddly enough, I was shot at. <laughs> uh, uh, in a, purely by accident, uh, and by one of our own people. Uh, we, were, we were on the ground, uh, going through the motions of looking after rifles and ammunition. Where was this now? This was in uh, here in Dublin. Oh, no, I think it was in Belfast. Belfast, yes. Uh, and uh, Padoop, off went this little burst of machine gun fire, three yeah. or four rounds. Yeah. Didn't hit anybody, fortunately, but gave everybody quite a start. <laughs> I didn't tell you. So you're AC2. I beg your pardon. AC2. AC2. I became an AC1. I became oh. an LAC. Oh. I became a leading aircraftsman. And at one brief period of my career, I was a temporary sergeant, but not paid as a sergeant. That lasted for about a fortnight. And we reverted to the more realistic rank uh, of leading aircraftsman. Now get that, LAC, leading aircraftsman. None of your AC-1 or AC-2 there. Was, was that mechanical? Uh, it, was, uh, it was automatic. <laughs> <laughs> once, you've been a, once you've been a certain time, yeah, you became I, an LAC. Oh, right, yeah. okay. So now, in, you started to write for, for newspapers in the RAF. I did. I, well, I began to, yes, I, I did. I, I wrote for the RAF newspapers. Uh, RAF news, news sheets, and then uh, uh, my father encouraged me uh, to send articles into various newspapers, and they were accepted some here and there, and they were published, and that's how I started up my career as a journalist. Yeah, speaking of Dad, Republican, 1916, true Irishman, having been through all of that, what was his reaction? To Bill and the son joining the Royal Air Force. 
Well, uh, at that time the war was virtually over. <laughs> Uh, and although he had fought the British in his day, mm. uh, he was uh, uh, an anti-Nazi. Uh, and when I joined the Royal Air Force, he was in a way gay. He was rather proud because it seemed such a uh, gallant thing to do in many ways. Uh, we were, we thought, we were putting our lives at risk. Anybody who was in the forces, your life was at risk. Uh, but it, that risk didn't last a long time with me, as I say. We were out of the war in no time flat. But my father, he, 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 he was rather proud of the fact that I was in the Air Force. It was, uh, it was doing something, uh, I won't say courageous, but uh, doing something in a military form and, and being and, Proved myself to be an anti-Nazi, although I, I didn't think I was an anti-Nazi. I just wanted to fly. But but you were reared with all of 1916 in your history and yes. spoken about and yes. discussed and and learned, yes. and all of the guys who were involved in 16 and the socialist thing as well, the the trade union thing as well. Very much so. Uh, a lot of my father's contemporaries uh, would have uh, been horrified at the fact that I joined the Royal Air Force. Uh, they were anti-British in many ways. But uh, my father, as I say, had, had become a, 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 an anti-Nazi. Uh, and he wasn't at all disturbed by the fact that I joined the Air Force. Uh, at least I was going to be doing something, you know. Burma. Burma, I went to Burma. Burma was a, a word feared by people. Uh, if you were in the forces and you were being sent overseas, uh, it was best to be sent to the Middle East, where uh, the war had sort of gradually come to a, uh, a gentle uh, end, or was coming to an end. But Burma always had the, uh, the name of, uh, for instance, the, the 14th Army in Burma was known as the Forgotten Army. Uh, you were so far away in Burma, nobody really cared about you. Uh, all the publicity was given to people in the Middle East and in, in Europe. Burma was the, the forgotten part of the world, and that's where we went. Now, having said that, uh, I spent two and a half years in the Far East, in Burma and India. And I was going to say I loved every minute of it. I didn't at the time, but I look back on it with great affection. Uh, and it's, it, it certainly made me, after I was only a youngster when I went in there, uh, but I became a man very quickly. You were a child when you went Well, I was. I was 16. Yeah. Uh, but by the time I was 18, I was, I was demobilized. I was demobilized from the British forces, still only 19 years of age. I mean, that's ridiculous to think of it now. I mean, nowadays people join up at 19 years of age. But I'd already done my time at that. I'd served, uh, uh, got my knees brown, as we used to say. OK, now let's, let's move ahead and talk about London. Um, wh when you made The Tonight Show, which was really, I suppose, one of the two flagship current affairs programs on BBC television at that time. As Mr. Woburn is wont to say, for a young fella from Marine or Fairview, Dublin, being inducted into The Tonight Team, that was like being canonized. You couldn't, you couldn't do much better. How did that come about? Well, uh, there were two great programs. There was The Tonight program, and there was a program called Panorama, which went out once a week. And, uh, Early on, the Tonight program sent people over, Magnus Magnuson uh, and a number of other people, over here to do little bits and pieces. And I did the research for them. So they were then looking to recruit people. And they, I was one, I applied for a job and was given a three month trial. And uh, after six months, I was still on the three months trial. Uh, and I, I, I was just kept on, I was given the job. Just as simple as that. Was that a good period in your life? I'll come to Patsy in a moment now. But, but London and BBC, was that, was that a, oh, a good yeah. time in your life? Oh, yeah. Working for the BBC in those days uh, was doing the top job. People would look on you with envy, people on other programmes. Was uh, this Bamberstock time and, and uh, Peacock time? And uh, Michael Peacock, indeed, yeah. yes, indeed it was. Uh, uh, they, were the, they were the great days of television. Uh, television was still relatively new, and uh, to be on television in any capacity 
uh, was something to be desired. But to actually appear on television, to actually appear on the Tonight program, marvellous. Did they treat you well? Oh, well now, to tell you the God's truth, the, uh, it, uh, the BBC was uh, not extraordinary. In RTE, presenters in those days ran the show. In the BBC, quite the opposite. The producers ran the show. You did what you were told. You were uh, educated into the way to behave. Uh, so I think that any success I've had was due in large measure to the fact that the BBC spent time and energy and money in training me. Telling you what to do. Telling me what to do. Keep and that how in. To, and how to do it. Yes, keep yeah. that in, leave Absolutely. that out. Yes, yeah. all yeah. of that sort of thing. Now, yeah. it was there, of course, you met Patsy. Can yeah. you recall for us the moment you first laid eyes on this I had lady? a great friend who I'd been in the Air Force with called Bob Whiten. And when I went over, uh, Jack White, who was the features editor of the Irish Times, sent me over to the London office to do a holiday relief. And White said, well, we've got to find you a bird while you're here. I said, oh, yeah. So he produced a lot of photographs. <laughs> they, they've one, got to find him a bird. This is the God's honest truth. One of those photographs was Patsy Jane Dyke. And I said, her. So that's how I met Instantly. Patsy. Instantly. The across very a, across the very a crowded first, room. Uh, uh, the very first week I was in London, he produced these half a dozen photographs of various girls. I can remember only two others. Uh, this, <laughs> uh, 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 this was the one I chose. So you picked her from a photograph? From a photograph. And was she a journal? She was in advertising. She ah. worked for Country Life magazine. Oh, good. Uh, and she, became, she worked in advertising for Country Life. But then eventually, when we, after we were married, uh, she was still doing advertising. And they said to her, we want a, a Sunday columnist. She said, I've never written anything in my life. You can write, just write something. And that's how she started. She immediately started off to write paragraphs. And that's how she be, be, became the Patsy Dyke column, which became hugely popular. Yeah. And how long did you know each other before you popped the question and, and ah. all of that? Or did we go well, through all that routine? You know, the awful thing about it, Gay, is this, that uh, it was a couple of years until one day on the telephone, she said, well, we keep on talking like this, but you never talk about, you say when we get married, you, you've never actually asked me to marry her. So she asked me if I would marry her, and I said, I <laughs> That's how it happened. It's called the direct method. On more dear. And it worked out well. It worked out well. The woman knew who she wanted to marry. <laughs> so, okay, so London, London was altogether a happy, happy time. Well, you, really, well, you were learning and so on. Um, now come back. You came, come back to Montrose and that this door opens for you. And when you, when you see the totality of the list of, of the things that opened for you at that time. Of course, there was Broadsheet and Newsbeat. I could never tell the difference between the two. The, we, we talked about tonight, uh, I'll come to Muhammad Ali in a moment. Uh, even the Olives yes. are, are um, uh, bleeding. Um, Emmett Dalton remembers that, that wonderful series of murder in, in Ireland. Wonderful. That you were really, yeah. yeah. really on top of your game on that yeah. and, and hidden history and all of that. Together with all of those, those other bits and pieces, shall we say, to do with newsbeat and broadsheet and all of that. Um, you could never have, have thought when you went in through the doors of Montrose, coming back from London at that time, that, that all of that would happen. Or, or oh, what, no, no, no. What was your ambition at that time? Uh, well, ultimately, I suppose, through vanity, to appear on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as I say, I, I wanted to be, a, to be on, a, on a, a television program. If it wasn't Panorama, and they, they decided that I wasn't serious enough for Panorama. Did they? Oh, they did. They didn't say that to me. But they, uh, <laughs> the indications were clearly there that I was too lightweight for it. So uh, they, they, I, I went on the Tonight program. And I had no regrets about it, Gay. I mean, I, I had the most marvelous time. Remember that, you know, really, people like you and I who are journalists, we've been very lucky in that people have paid to send us to different parts of the world and give us money for it as well. <laughs> uh, uh, and, I, you know, I, I look back on it and I think, Jesus O'Shaughnessy, you've been very lucky. 
very lucky, very lucky. There, there, was a, there seems to have been a hive of activity at that time. You had the advantage over me. I was stuck in Montrose because I was on the wireless five days a week and mm -hmm. daddy, daddy, daddy. But you got out around the country and met the people. We did. And thereby you found stories. Yes. Now, is there any truth whatsoever in the rumor that the stories really depended on the contiguous nature of a good restaurant a drinking establishment, Absolutely true. lobster and oysters. <laughs> Absolutely true. What we would do is this, we would think, now, uh, this week we will go to Clare and Galway. Uh, now, let's see, what restaurant are we going to open at this time of year? Okay, yeah, we can go there, somewhere. Which is why we had, from Donegal down to Kerry, we went to all of those counties. You never saw us working in Offaly. <laughs> or, uh, or Kildare, or places like that, no. because they, they had no seafood in them. <laughs> <laughs> I, see. I, I thought you were going to say that this was a damnable rumour, which you denied. <laughs> Put out by Dick Hill, Lord Reston, and John Kelleher, and John McAlgan, and, and Paul Cusack. I, I, I wouldn't but dare to lie in the presence of those No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't <laughs> recommend it. Right? <laughs> uh, because they could easily find me out. No. Uh, we, we looked on places and thought, where would be nice to go this month? Um, if we were stuck in Dublin, that was great, but you had to find places that would not only feed you well, but pay you well in expenses. Uh, so that's, that's the way we worked. And it was known, Dick Hill, God be good to him, knew that. He was our of boss. Course, of course he did. Uh, and uh, allowed us to get away with it. I mean, I look up, I, I think, of, the late great Dick Hill, and I think, well, thanks be to God for him. He did so much for all. <laughs> Me too. He, Me too. He, he did. Yeah, he mm. did. Me too. Mm. Um, it, it's, it seems to me to have been a riotous time, actually. Not only were you working, but there was a lot of laughter going on there and was. a lot of skit and fun. There was. There was. It was fun. Uh, I, I can never think of a time uh, when I would say to myself, oh, Christ, I've got to do this. There was never a day in television that I didn't look forward to. There was never a day in television that I wasn't glad that I'd been there and done that. Uh, it, it was a wonderful time. Uh, as I say, God was good to me, uh, and Dick Hill was good to me. They were wonderful days. Wonderful, wonderful days. days. Um, <laughs> I have to ask you that the rumor also got about that in all of these travels, you certainly were at all times extremely attractive to women. <laughs> and in, in spite of attaining a certain age at our stage in life, there's a, a slightly dawning hope still residual in all of us that there might be one last shot in the locker of some kind. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I we're talking now in the context of, of, of the last sting of a dying wasp. <laughs> but, but in fact, to what do you credit your attractiveness to women? It's a long introduction to that question, but I'm hoping for an answer. Well, I think, yes. I think, I think you know, Gay, that sting has stung. <laughs> uh, I haven't had a bad thought in my head for years. You're, you're lying. Or no, it's the truth. It's, you're the, lying. it's the truth. Uh, I can vaguely remember uh, what all of that thing was like. Uh, I, I don't look back uh, with envy and, and think, I wish it could happen again. But I wouldn't be too displeased if it did. <laughs> <laughs> my answer to which is, you have some chance. <laughs> Anyway, to what do you credit? What is your skill with women? We want to know. I want I, to know. I, I don't think of any skill with women at all. I, I, yes, I, no, you do. I, yes, yes, yes. To be yes, absolutely yes. truthful. Yes. I think that that uh, uh, women have always flattered me. Some women have always flattered me. Why? Uh, uh, they've, they've always been prepared to listen to my raw machings and ramblings. And they've never said to me, feck off. <laughs> uh, you're a nuisance. Uh, uh, so I, I don't know. I've, I've just been lucky. I, I can't think. I'm not. Uh, I, 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 I should say this. I'm not good looking. I'm not bad looking. But, but I'm not good looking. I'm not handsome. I don't have broad shoulders and a thin. I'm not Muhammad Ali. You know, I'm not a gorgeous looking creature. Uh, but I would like to think that sometimes, that to some people, I'm desirable.
Only he would get away with it. That <laughs> it's a magnificent thought, isn't it, that never in the entire course of this man's life did any woman say to him, feck off, you <laughs> It's a wonderful thing. Yes, Larry? Somebody asked, asked him that question many years ago. Yes. His answer was, I remember it called to this day, I might be a small man, but I'm a very busy little man. <laughs> <laughs> and in those days, thank God I was. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Okay. Now, that's, that's the women I was... I, I haven't learned anything from that at all. You talk to them, that's the secret. You talk to women, that's the secret. Uh, that's it, that's you it. Talk to and them. I listen to them. Oh, you listen to them. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? Anyway, um, uh, uh, Muhammad Ali, the, f the first thing that comes into your mind when I mention Muhammad Ali, what is it? Instantly. His warmth. His warmth. And the size of his shagging boots. Yes. <laughs> he, his hands gave were no bigger than mine, but he's the biggest feet you've ever seen. He must have been wearing size 17s. Really? I mean, they were, they were gigantic. Mm. Uh, um, but uh, he, I, I, when I began to do this, I, obviously enough, one feels intimidated by the sheer physical size of the man and the loveliness of him and so on like that. But you must remember, he had done hundreds of interviews. So really, it wasn't that my interview with him was so good. It was that he was good at my interview. Do you know what I mean? He had done this a, a thousand times. Uh, so it was, e it was easy for me. But I felt a certain warmth towards him. And I, I, I thought I thought I saw a warmth in his eyes. Uh, he which, was a likable guy. Absolutely. Deli a, a wonderfully delightful man. An absolutely delightful man altogether. I feel desperately sad now when I see odd glimpses of him in his, oh, yeah. in his presence. Yeah, well, I mean, to see him, that staggering sort of shuffling thing, uh, shuffling thing it's, first of all, it's incredible. It's hard to believe because I think of him as that vital, uh, immensely warm individual who, whose very presence captured you. Uh, and and, and uh, I mean, he, he, he was, hard to say this or so, but he was very lovable, you know. Mm. He, he really was, mm. he really was. He, he was is universally man. loved, he's just one of those guys. Did you spend much time with him before the interview? No, very little. Uh, uh, literally minutes, uh, time enough to sort of uh, be afraid, <laughs> to tell you the truth, of how it was going to go. Uh, but as I say, as we, as, uh, as we went into it, it just got warmer and warmer. No, I spent very little time with him in advance. Uh, and he, 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 I remember this, he, even in, in the interview, he called me Mr. O'Shannon, or I think Mr. Shannon. Easier. Uh, easier, yes, indeed. No, it was, a, it, was a, it was a wonderful time and a wonderful experience. And um, uh, I suppose it was, uh, I, I think, the highlight of my television experience, really. The highlight? I, I believe I believe it was. Yes. I believe it was, yeah. Because I was going to ask you, looking back on it now, what, 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 what was the happiest period in your life? What was the best thing you reckon you've ever done? Impossible question to answer, I know, but I'm asking yeah. you. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, in, uh, once you got into television, once, you, once we, I, I got into the, the business, it seemed so, it became natural. It didn't seem like a job. Uh, it became something easily done, uh, because, as I say, he himself was easily talked to. Uh, there were no real awkwardnesses in it. Mm. Uh, the, I, I can't think of ever thinking of it as, oh, Christ, what am I going to do now? What am I going to say now? Because it, it, it was all just happening. Anyway, he was a performer, and once he, he started getting laughs, laughs absolutely, he, he, he absolutely. couldn't stop. Terrific. Yeah, but he, he, didn't, he didn't steal your thunder. No. I mean, he, he let you, uh, to a certain extent, he let you be yourself. Go back again to Newsbeat and Broadsheet and traveling around the country, Dick Hill and Paul Hill. You, know, um, you must have been a major star then, because television was so new, and was the wonder of the age, and here was the guy walking amongst us who was up on, on that box. You, you must have felt that oh, going around yes. the country. Well, uh, okay, as you, you will well remember as well, when you were on television and you went to a small town uh, to do your thing, people came out to look at you. 
they actually came out to look at you and uh, to be to be talked to, to to physically to touch you people wanted to shake your hand to put their arm on your shoulder um, which was very flattering uh, and uh, although uh, I suppose we the actors uh, would uh, sort of shrug it off and uh, appear uh, not to notice. We were delighted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was it was heartwarming. It was uh, flattering. Yes. And we wanted to be flattered. Yeah. Um, do you ever think that you're like your father? Funny you should say that. Looking in the mirror only yesterday. Let me just put it like this. I was actually having a key looking in the mirror. <laughs> the mirror there, As one I thought, does. She says, you've got a different spit of your ovary. You've got that cranky look about you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, really, I thought, God, isn't that incredible? I do look like him when he was an old crotchety man. Uh, and I'm now an old, no, old crotchety, crotchety man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, very like him. Uh, and saying the same things. Well, my mannerisms, in many ways, I walk rather like him. I shuffle rather like him. Um, uh, I, I don't think I can never remember my father ever being cross or saying a cross word to anybody really? whereas I can of course I have been cross all my life uh, uh, he, he, was, he was always a, a very gentle towards people uh, the only person I ever saw having a row with was with my mother and that was the normal uh, cotton thrust of uh, marriages you know, the remarkable, you probably know this game, maybe some of you here know it. Uh, uh, my father and mother weren't married. So I was born a bastard. <laughs> and my wife, uh, Patsy, knew this. And uh, in the last couple of years of my father and mother's life, she said, it might be nice if you got married. And, if, uh, if, 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 if they got married. They got, they got married. And... Uh, she arranged for not one, but two priests to come in and marry them. And they were married at my mother's bedside. But to her pleasure. Of we had a party afterwards about it. And, 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 and she died then? She died then within a year. And, and why didn't they get married? Uh, Don't tell me you never I asked, Of course I asked my father yes. that. And he said, we never seem to have the time. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose as good an answer as any. Wonderful. Wonderful. So that resolved all of that. Yes. Stab in the dark that was. Just going back, apart from Muhammad Ali, a period in your life which was happiest or the best bit of work you did or whatever, that you sort of say, yeah, there was nothing else that. No. There's, no. there's uh, when I look back at my years, it all seems rather humdrum. Uh, there are no really outstanding uh, things that, that I remember. No, there aren't, Kay. There are, there aren't, nothing I could, uh, apart from the Hamad Ali thing, nothing I could put my, my okay. finger to. Did not you ever really. pine to be anything else, like an accountant or a pilot or a... a oh, a, a, yes. yes. What, what oh, yes, I wanted to be a pilot. Oh, you wanted to be of a pilot? Course. Yes, of course, yes. Of course, yes. I wanted to be. I wanted to yes. fly. Yes, but... Uh, uh, I wanted to be... Uh, then when it became obvious to me that I, I didn't have the uh, malum, the get-up-and-go, the... Uh, 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 capability of being a pilot for which you had to have certain abilities which I didn't have I thought the next best thing was to be a gunner and the idea of sitting behind four guns four 303s <laughs> and, and going like this thrilled me I must say and I got the opportunity I fired four guns at one time on the ground mind you frightened the life out of you <laughs> frightened the life out of you so you do realise of course that the, that the rear gunner was the first they went for in well the, uh, I, I whenever people said that to me I said well I wanted to be mid up <laughs> <laughs> I want to fly in Lancaster in the mid up 50-50 but if you wanted to be a flyer why didn't you go out to Weston like the rest of us and learn during all that period when you were with Montrose and with all of that I, I Not that kind the, of flying. To get up and go to do it, Kate. I see. You learned to fly. So, yeah, at one stage, a long, long time yeah. ago. But, uh, so nothing else then, apart from flying, there nothing, was nothing else that you wanted to do. Nothing that I could think of that, that I really wanted yeah. to do. Yes. Broadcasting and, and uh, flying were the two I'm things I wanted to do most in all the world. Do you want to tell them about the Reverend Mother of Kyle Moore Abbey? The other, one other of your celebrated interviews. If you don't, I'll tell them. You'd best tell the girl. <laughs> you'd best tell them. Live. <laughs> 
on Broadsheet or Newsbeat, I don't know which, which it was, interviewing the Reverend Mother of Kylemore Abbey, yeah. who was a very uppity class of lady, you know, very nice school. And she was complaining bitterly in the course of the interview that her grant from the department, surprise, surprise, had been cut. And, and she was saying, you know, Cahill, she said, we used to have over 200 girls here boarding. And we're now down to about 85. And Cahill said, oh, sister, you poor whore, you must be broken. <laughs> And it was gone. She, she didn't play. <laughs> but all of them, I could feel that. <laughs> not, not her. Not her. And not me. <laughs> did she, I wonder, did she even understand? She it, probably didn't, thank God. No. Thank you. She, that poor her was a terrible dear. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed, it was. It indeed. Was. Okay. All right. I have nothing else to talk to you. Does anybody else want to put a question to, uh, to Carl? Yes, sir. Carl, is there any story that got away that you wish you could have gone back to? Any um, story that got away yeah. from this journalist? Good one. Uh, well, uh, I suppose we all wanted, I, I suppose we all wanted to, to be the, the main player in a, a fight in which won a decoration. If not the Victoria Cross, <laughs> then at least, at least uh, the DFC. The, well, at least the DFC. <laughs> uh, and uh, I mean, I, I can still, okay, I can still see in, among my older colleagues, I can still see men with rows of ribbons. I can see the DFC and a couple of AFCs and two fellows that won it. And I, I can remember seeing DSOs on men's breasts. Whereas I went around with my single war medal. Uh, 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 that, was, that was my only gong, I must say. I didn't, I didn't get any gongs for yeah. editing. No, so no story that you missed that you'd love to have been on? No, not that you can think of? Not, not that I can Got think away, of. Got away, yeah. No. Anybody else? Is Godfrey building up? Yes, Godfrey. Thank you. Just to say, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Just to say, it's a privilege to be here today. But this young man, O'Shannon, what a guy to work with as a journalist. But, you know, we were doing the Miss World contest in, um, in, in, in the, you know, uh, London. And boy, this man, O'Shannon, was so emphatic about what he wanted to say and how he wanted to say it that he almost had a punch up with the producer. He was so dedicated to what he wanted to do and he believed what he wanted to do. And I remember working in, in the Arctic with, with Kyle up off of, top of uh, Norway there and uh, uh, coming very, very late at night at 12 o'clock in a little steamer and we were, we were to visit a, a local pub and uh, we got out of the steamer and it was snowing and we, six or eight of us, just uh, very quietly found this little pub and we went in and it was full of very strange Norwegians and I think they had a look at us and they just didn't approve of us. And we were invading their space at 12 o'clock at night. I mean, we like going into a pub in the west of Ireland and strangers arrive, you know. But some, one of these guys in the corner looked at Cahill in a very strange way and then went into the loo and was missing for a while and then came out. And I remember distinctly, Cahill, him coming and looking straight into your face and then putting his hand straight into your pint of beer. And at that point, our producer said, listen, uh, I don't think we're, we're welcome here. Uh, I think we better quietly fold our tents and get out of here quick. But the, the contrast with O'Shannon is extraordinary. We were in, uh, in 72, we were in, in Cyprus with Ted Dolan. And, uh, you know, uh, he brought us into a pub in the middle of the sweltering heat of July or August. And he set up the whole team because he brought us into this pub and there's this very exotic uh, Turkish dark haired woman who was the bartender. And she was looking after our needs and so on and it was very, very hot. And suddenly she jumped up onto the stage, onto the bar, threw off all her clothes and you know, danced up and down the bar. Now, we were fairly innocent young Dubliners at the time, but O'Shannon set this up, and this is the sort of thing he would do. But anyway, <laughs> uh, you know, Deny he, it, he, Deny he knew it, about this, sake. but it's just been a privilege just being around when he was around. Good. Well done, Dr. Thank you.
Rav Gopi said there, and it shows how lucky we were. There we were at one said, almost up in the North Pole. I mean, yeah. you all paid to send us the most extraordinary <laughs> thing. We, we had the greatest gas. It was the, without doubt, gay. It was fun. the greatest fun. Uh, I, I, I look back on it with, with great happiness. You know, the, it, it, was, it was wonderful. Uh, in those days, one could sort of say uh, to the, our masters in RTE, I think we ought to go to Southeast Asia. <laughs> and they would look blandly and say, all right. <laughs> and off we go, spending your money like nobody's <laughs> Well, it sounds like utopia right now. Anybody else now? We've time for one more, that's all. Anybody else? No other contributors. Oh, yes, is that um, uh, Eamon? Carl, the last time I met you, we were actually sitting in a church seat, or on a church seat, at a funeral, and Charlie Hawhey came up behind us and said something. He actually whispered something to you. And I often wondered, did you ever actually interview Charlie Hawhey? Oh, I did. Uh, well, now, let's put it like this. You didn't interview Charlie Hawhey. <laughs> Charlie Hawhey decided what was going to be done. Uh, and uh, you were put in the position of a, uh, almost a, an idiot. And uh, he, he made me go, no, I must say this. People say, oh, Charlie, that bastard, and so on. Like that. And I, he could be a bastard. My distinct and absolute memory of Charlie is this. When he wasn't looking directly at you, but you could see him out of the court, you could see his eyes swivel toward you. <laughs> and they, they were the coldest eyes that you've ever seen in your And hooded. Uh, absolutely. Dangerous eyes. He really... His, if looks could kill, <laughs> Charlie would have killed his stone dead. But if he was on your side... He well, thanks to God. Charlie. Th thanks, well, of course he would. And you see, my wife, Patsy, adored him. Uh, and I will never forget this. Um, she was working with the Sunday Press, and she was getting a guinea a week or something like that. And she gave... Charlie was looking for money to... You know, to... Buy shirts. <laughs> You know, to, to go to be elected. And she gave him her week's pay. I thought, Jesus Christ. <laughs> what possessed you, woman? Why didn't you give it to me? Did he, did he, was this personally she gave it? Personally. And did yeah. he say thank you? Oh, yes. Thank she you. was very fond of him. She, I mean, she thought he was lovely. Uh, she, she wasn't the only one, uh, well, I mean, clearly. She, but she was one of the earlier ones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she, she really was terribly fond of him, and I must say that he was very fond of her, and it was always utterly charming towards her. Utterly charming. Of course. As you say, he could be. Indeed. He could be. Indeed. Indeed. Okay, one more now, please. Do I see a hand up? No hands up. They've run out of... Ah, for, uh, can, can I just, just, just before you speak... Fanula, can I just tell you the link here today of embarrassment about this man, okay? I was doing one of our Meaning of Life programs down in the thing gallery in Parnell Square. And Roger Childs, who was our producer, my subject was sitting there, and Roger Childs, our producer, softly said, okay, roll, and in your own time, gang. And I said, good evening, welcome again. And our guest tonight is Fanula O'Shannon. And I want to start, Fanula, by asking you, daddy, 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 da. And Fanula said, actually, my name is Fanula Flanagan. I don't know Fanula. <laughs> and the reason was, of course, that I'd just been talking to John McColgan about him <laughs> on the phone. And so O'Shannon was in my head. And I have a sister, Fanula. Of course, of course, of course. Fanula, please do. Thank you. Thank This is Fanula O'Shannon. Anyway, this is, I just wanted to say that of all of the Irish bastards I've ever met, <laughs> you are the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> I think on that cheerful note, <laughs> I think it's time to end.